instead of going away from Gilead, as everyone thought we were doing in the 90s, we turned around and started going back towards Gilead. And we know that if you give people unlimited power and no checks and balances, they will behave badly. Today, we're going to have a conversation with Ms. Margaret Atwood. First name, last name, Margaret Atwood. Boat. The Testaments! I'm excited to find out what makes Ms. Atwood tick. She's kind of the Canadian literary queen, and as a Canadian myself, I can't wait to deep dive into talking about this book. Margaret, as you know, BookTube is a vibrant community of readers who come to YouTube to share their love of books and reading and learning. And we are so excited to be gathered here with you, IRL, to discuss your latest novel, The Testaments. Now, The Testaments is a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, which was published more than 30 years ago. Can you tell us why did you write the sequel and why now? People had been wanting me to write a sequel for a long, long time. Yeah and I wasn't gonna do it. And then a couple of things happened. Number one, instead of going away from Gilead, as everyone thought we were doing in the 90s, we turned around and started going back towards Gilead. And by we, you mean? I mean. Real life. In particular, the United States. Mm -hmm. This outfit that the handmaids yeah. are made yeah. to wear has become a symbol of the women's movement in the United States. What do you think about that? Well, it started in Texas. It started in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> there was a moment when a lot of men in dark states were going to sign into law legislation restricting women's bodies again. 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 So <laughs> these women decided that they would put on the handmaid's outfit and go and just sit in the legislature. As a protest, it's quite brilliant because nobody can kick you out for creating a disturbance. Nobody can kick you out for dressing immodestly. Right. Mm -hmm. But everybody looking at it knows what it means. Mm -hmm. So that's where it spread from in this iteration. What happens in the Testaments is you get three different perspectives on the concept of good and evil and the choices we make and mm. why we make those choices. Mm. So can you talk about your experience with writing about human behavior and what it is about us that creates the Testaments? Okay, so there's four kinds of stories. Ordinary people during ordinary times, ordinary people during extraordinary times, extraordinary people during ordinary times, and extraordinary people during extraordinary times. An ordinary person in ordinary times doesn't usually get to choose, doesn't have to choose between good and evil. So totalitarian regimes stick it to people about the choices. What do I do? Do I go along with it? Do I resist overtly and get shot immediately? Do I join the underground. Yeah. Of course, we all think we would be quite heroic. <laughs> we, we may be wrong about that. I feel like the character we're really talking about is Aunt Lydia. Yes. Well, she's the leader of the aunts contingent, the enforcers of women in Gilead. In The Handmaid's Tale, which I just reread, I was very much like, Gah! She's such a villain, <laughs> right? <laughs> then in this book, we see from her actual perspective, and you learn what she had to go through to get to this point, mm -hmm. and what decisions she's making, and how ultimately she's hoping to try her best to bring down Gilead. As with Handmaid's Tale, I put nothing in that I didn't have uh, historical references yeah. for. And there were a number of people like this, both in the Nazi regime and in the Stalinist regime in Russia. There's an interesting book, because I read a lot of books about World War II. Himmler had a masseur. Himmler suffered from all these strange aches and pains, and this massage guy was the only one who could alleviate his suffering. So he would get Himmler on the table, and then he would get promises out of him to save this person or that person while he was doing the massaging. 
So you would say that he was complicit with the regime, sure, but from within it, he was doing these savings of people. My name is Ariel Bassett. I've been making YouTube videos since 2011, when I was very lonely and needed someone to talk to about books. I can finally talk about this feminism stuff. Growing up in Canada, Margaret Atwood is very much one of the literary icons of our country. It's so cool that basically our biggest author is a woman writing badass fiction. I want to ask you about the most powerful moment in the book for me. It was the moment where I was just, I felt so viscerally there. And it's when Agnes first walks in and sees a pile of books and asks, why are these so flammable, so ruinous? Right? So I wanted to ask you, why did you decide to take away the right for in Gilead for women to be able to read and to write? What makes them so flammable and so ruinous? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so they got their right taken away because people have had that right taken away in history. Mm -hmm. And most noteworthily, under slavery in the United States, it was illegal for slaves to read and write. Right. So if you read the biography of Frederick Douglass, yes. for instance, that moment when he learns to read and yes. write, it's very, very powerful. Yeah. So reading and writing gives you access to knowledge mm -hmm. that other people don't want you to have. Right. And uh, that is why regimes try to control, censor, burn, destroy uh, any books that might contradict them. Mm. Gilead goes all the way and makes it impossible for women to read and write because then they can tell the women what's in the Bible, although it isn't necessarily. Right, and when she starts to read it, she realizes she this is not what I was this told. This is not what I was told, right. exactly. I have a feeling you actually probably know the exact percentage of how many women there are in the world versus men. 51. See, I knew she would know that. <laughs> so I just want to know, patriarchy, I'm just like, how did this happen? A long, long time ago, there were hunter-gatherer societies. And in hunter-gatherer societies, women are far more equal. But then you get the advent of wheat. What do you need to grow wheat? You need upper body strength. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you need to defend the wheat? You need a standing army to defend your territory. The other thing you need for this kind of setup is more children to help you farm the wheat. Mm -hmm. whereas hunter-gatherer societies limited their populations. So this is not nature's plan. It's not inevitable. It happened at a certain time in history. Rationales were then made up for why it should be so, mm -hmm. as they are for any kind of power structures that benefit the top slice, right. which is who writes the texts, mm -hmm. right? But change is happening now because you don't need a lot of upper body strength to work a keyboard. Yes. 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 Indeed. So let's talk about you working that keyboard. We would love to hear. <laughs> <laughs> we would, we've gone back to ancient history, the beginning of patriarchy. What about the beginning of Margaret Atwood? Like you, I grew up in the wilderness of northern mm. Minnesota. You grew up in Quebec, right? Northern Quebec, yeah. Yes. And I'm curious about how that shaped you as a human and as a writer, your time in the woods. Did you have electricity? I did not have electricity. I did not have indoor plumbing. I didn't have running water. Then you understand everything. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, I feel very kindred with you in that regard. I mean, people think of my experience in the wilderness associated with my book, Wild, but yeah. it actually began much before that. Mm. Yeah. That's why I was curious about your girlhood okay. in the woods. Self-reliance, mm -hmm. knowing where you are so you don't get lost That's right. in the woods. Never throw anything out because you might need it. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. You never know when you might need a little duct bit tape? of wire. We didn't have duct tape here. I'm OK, I'm here. the next generation. <laughs> pieces of string. But also, no television, no movie theaters, no school, no library. Hardly any people. No town, hardly mm. any people. Yeah. But we did have books. Right. Mm. And we did have, I don't know where they got them, because it was wartime, but that we did have some paper and pencils and crayons. And we did a lot of drawing and writing of these little books. And I think that, therefore, the, the book became my one art form that I really had any access to. 
we're all dying to know <laughs> oh, about yeah. the beautiful exterior of this book. So on the front here, we, we have a, a woman who clearly lives in Gilead. And on the back, we have a woman who clearly lives in the promised land. And then there's the hidden girl. Yeah. And yes. There, yes. And there's a the hidden girl in the back. Hold I don't on. think there's a hidden girl, girl in the back. back. Wait, maybe Where I missed the... There's the hat. I see it. There's the girl. We're trying wait, to find oh, the hidden wait, girl in the, the back. Ponytail. Missed that. The mm. cover of the book is by Nona Barr. Oh. And when it first arrived, uh, it was this part was, was pale blue, and I thought it looked somewhat cold. Mm -hmm. So I changed them to spring green. I <laughs> mm. got out my crayons and colored the cover. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that has happened since The Handmaid's Tale has been published is the world has very much read that book. They have also seen a movie adaptation of the book and now a television show. Did you have to do some coordinating in terms of those characters? We didn't want to do anything that was directly, flatly contradictory to what was in the show. Right. That was a bit difficult because I was writing the book in advance of them writing some of the show. Mm. But I could talk with the showrunner wow. and say, I, I need you to not kill Aunt Lydia, please. <laughs> you must or, keep her alive. I, yeah. You refer to the work you do as speculative fiction, not science fiction or regular fiction. Can you talk not more about fantasy, that? Not fantasy, yes. <laughs> not fantasy, yeah. Uh, so if you think of a line that descends from Jules Verne in the 19th century, who was writing about submarines and big balloons, and then from Jules Verne, we have Brave New World, we have 1984, we have Fahrenheit 451. That's the family of stories to which Anne Maid's Tale and the Testaments belong. Did you read those books as a young woman? Oh, of course, and <laughs> many did you, others besides. Do you remember the first book that you read in this category of speculative fiction? It was probably Animal Farm, except that's more like a fantasy. <laughs> but of course, I read it as a, as a child, and I didn't realize that it was a political satire. Yes. I thought it was Russian. about real animals, and it just <laughs> yeah. absolutely ruined me. My name's Evelyn, and I go by Evelyn from the internets online. Me, I was fly, skin glistening in the Louisiana sign. I like to call myself a digital storyteller. I feel like I'm repping for the 24 to 34 black women in the US. Margaret and I are gonna do some lightning round questions. Are you ready? <laughs> All right, favorite book or author as a kid? Pick an age. Um, eight. Eight, okay. Eight, I was reading a lot of Andrew Lang, Red Fairy Book, Green Fairy Book, mm -hmm. yet all, all of these fairy tales. What did you wanna be when you grew up? Okay, at which age? Eight. When I was eight. I didn't have a lot of ambitions when I was eight. Let's let's take 11. Oh, okay. 11, I was gonna be a famous painter. Ooh. Ooh. What's your favorite time period in history? Henry VIII is endlessly fascinating to read about, but it would have been hell to have been actually in his court mm -hmm. because your head would be next to roll. What's your biggest pet peeve? My biggest pet peeve is people who do not acknowledge or understand that we are in a climate emergency. In A Handmaid's Tale, it's an environmental crisis. And I'm curious why you wanted to have the environment, because you are an environmentalist, yeah, like why sure. is that an important topic to think about how that could be a contributing factor to because that leading? Because everything's connected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you're seeing that right now. So you're seeing climate emergency, things get warmer, mm -hmm. food supplies go down, there are crop failures, there are famines, there are hurricanes, there are floods. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of that affects food supply and social stability. Mm -hmm. As things stop working, people become angry and fearful, and they think it's somebody's fault and they think if they can overturn whoever's in charge and put somebody else in charge, that it will get better. Yeah. But we know that if you give people unlimited power and no checks and balances, they will behave badly. <laughs> we have seen that time and time again. Mm -hmm. That's why there should always be checks, balances, oversights on, on any kind of power. Left to its own devices, it just gets worse. What I noticed and I love is that you put song to the story and it feels very real and it adds so much depth to the world. How did you, not even just come up with the songs, but how did you find the bright place in the story, put the songs in the story? Right. In? Every culture sings. It stood to reason for me, number one, that the ants would have 
liturgical songs and also that children would invent songs and dark rituals. And that's why it's so rich. That's why it adds so much depth to the world. Because it's in the world. So a little happy skippity hoppity version of childhood with no awareness mm -hmm. of darker motifs oh, is not going to feel real to us at all because we've been children. We know it's not true. Hi, my name is Amory, and my YouTube channel is Amory. I'm a writer, I am a singer-songwriter. One thing I love is having an extensive library, and that doesn't mean grabbing anything, it means grabbing things that I think not only will interest me, not only that I will hopefully enjoy, but also things that I may want to reread. The most important thing when you're reading literature is to see humanity in its at its best and at its worst. I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind sharing with us the last line. The last line is, love is as strong as death. And it is a quote, as you know, from the Bible, and it is from the Song of Solomon. It makes it so admirable that you're an optimist and that you're able to maintain this hope about But I see humanity. a lot of good things that they do, too. Some people do some quite brave things which some of us would also do under the circumstances, maybe. But we don't really know, faced with uh, impossible choices and, and difficult decisions, we don't really know what we would do until we're there. I was so moved by the end of the book. When I read the last page, I was on an airplane, and I burst into tears at the last oh. line. Did you cry after you wrote that final line? Did I cry? Well, tears were shed during the writing of the book. You've written about a society where evil has prevailed for a long time. And what we see, I think, so much in the Testaments is the testament to love and a great sense of hope. Well, there is hope. The hopeful part is that Gilead did not last. The yeah. open question is, what replaced it? Mm -hmm. Margaret Atwood, Thank you so much for joining us on BookTube today. And thank you all. Yes, thank it's you. so much more fun to discuss books with friends. Yes. Yes. So thanks, thanks for being here, thank all of you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Are you making your own, your own little tubes? Yes. Are you a quotes influencer? I am. <laughs>